Peak Tour with Amazing Blessing. Um, we're going to go through a few things today. We're going to continue our study on Jesus. But I want to start. Um, I want to start by just reading a little bit from Proverbs, and, it, and it's a description of what a woman, a biblical Christian woman, should be. And, and I know that as we read this, the same way goes for the men when we hear Scripture. It's easy to point out, oh, but that's not me. That's not me. I don't do that. But I assure you that if you're in this room right now, God is working on you. God is taking you to become the person who he created you to be, or else you wouldn't be here today. So you have an opportunity each day to strive a little harder, to reach a little farther, and to spend more time with Jesus, because really that's what's going to make the difference. So I'm going to start by reading from Proverbs. I'm in chapter 31, and I'm going to start at, uh, at verse 17. Tell me if this sounds like a mom you know. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all of her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. You know, biblically, when we hear things like that, it's, Easy to think, man, I, I just don't add up. I don't measure up. However, I assure you that the verses they are describing a mother are exactly how your children and your family look at you. So if you're a mom here today, you should be proud of yourself. It's not an easy job being a parent. I'm sure it's not an easy job being a grandparent. It's difficult. You've got to make hard decisions. You've got to do things that are unpopular. And you might not always be liked. But the good news is, as long as you've got your heart in the right place and the Lord's leading you, you will always be loved. You will always be loved. So we're going to take communion. We're going to take some prayers. And we did a little thing, and we got the moms some flowers. So I'm going to hand these out. And just remember, I don't know anything about flowers. If they die, I'm very sorry. <laughs> But I do believe in miracles, so I think you guys can keep them alive. There we go. Yay. Oh, pretty. There we go. Aww. Mm -hmm. You're a mom too, right? I'm a mom. Oh, my goodness. But I don't need it. I'm not good with flowers. <laughs> I'm good with kids, but not flowers. <laughs> you can't be any worse than Malaya. No, no, it's Are your kids still alive? Yeah. Then you can take care of that flower. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> they are now. They are still alive. Okay. <laughs> you two are going to have to plant these flowers together. Right, so Join custody. Amen. <laughs> you know, and we, we can't, I didn't think it would, it would be right to celebrate Mother's Day without remembering what Jesus did for us. And so we're going to take communion together. And make sure you take some time before you take communion to examine yourself. You know, there's so many things we can easily pass away uh, looking at the Ten Commandments and say it's sin. But I assure you there's many things that aren't listed that are also sin. And you know what they are. You know, it's, it's not as if we've got to do some deep dig to figure out what we have in our lives that need to be removed. So take some time before you take communion today and ask the Lord to remove any iniquities and to forgive you of any sins you've committed. I know I've got a lot to ask forgiveness for, so I just want y'all to join in with me. Jason, you mind leading us today? Sure.
to examine yourselves and just think about what Jesus has done before we do this in remembrance of him. So we do this, we take the body and blood of Christ because we remember what he did for us and he told us to do this. On the night before he was crucified at the Last Supper, he... Uh, sat down with his disciples, told him he wouldn't be with them much longer, but he gave us this ability to uh, receive him. This is why we do this. We do this because this is his way of giving himself to us. And when he uh, took the bread with the disciples, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. And that's something we need to remember, that it was his body that was broken for us. And then anytime you feel like you're inadequate and that your sins are too much and all that, remember... His, this is his body given to you. That should be a, a sign of comfort there to remind you that it was his sacrifice and that because of it we have forgiveness. And you can forgive yourself because of what Christ has done as long as you trust and believe in him. So we do this in remembrance. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So then after they took the bread... Then he lifted up the cup, and he said that this cup symbolizes a new covenant. You no longer need to uh, sacrifice a lamb in the temple uh, for the forgiveness of all sins, because Jesus was the perfect lamb. He came to be that, sacri that once and for all sacrifice. He died for all the sins of mankind at one time right here. And this blood symbolizes that sacrifice. So that's why he said, you know, drink this in remembrance of me. So we take it now. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us. And that we know that uh, no matter how much we messed up, no matter how much we, uh, we feel like it's hopeless, we know that uh, you paid the price for it all. And because of your sacrifice, because of the fact that you loved us so much, that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten yes. son, we have forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, we know that we have a second chance. We have a million chances. Your God has a million chances that... As long as we keep coming back to you, remembering who our Lord and Savior is, and uh, you're graceful to us. We didn't do, do it because it, we didn't deserve it. But we know that because we can come to you, we have that forgiveness, and that should comfort us all. And we thank you, Lord, for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. <clears throat> So, Taryn would call it a backstory, but I'm going to give you the recap of where we're at. We're going to be in Genesis 41 today. So, so far, we've got Joseph, Jojo. Jojo has had a rough go of it. So, started off, he's the favorite son of many brothers, a large family, but his brothers hate him. He's, he's dad's favorite. Not only is uh, he tell on his brothers when they mess up, when they don't follow orders, but he's also out there rocking a coat of many colors like a tuxedo while his brothers have all got on t-shirts. He's a favorite. But inherently, Joseph's really done nothing wrong that we know of. So what's going on is his brothers are so jealous that they seek an opportunity to destroy him. They snatch Joseph up and they aim to kill him. Reuben steps in and he says, no, 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 don't shed his blood. Don't kill him. Let's, let's, just, let's just throw him in the hole. Let's just put him in the pit. Reuben had a plan. See, everybody thinks, oh, Reuben, Reuben saved him. But 
really, Reuben was on the outs with his father. So Reuben thought if they hid Joseph away, he'd come back later, save him, go back to dad, look what I did, and he's restored. We don't know anybody that does stuff like that, do we? <laughs> try, to, try to get back in right standing by being sneaky. So plan falls through because Shemishmaelites show up and they sell Joseph into slavery. So on the way to Egypt, Joseph chained up. He arrives, he's a young man, and he's a teenager, 17 years old, and now he's a slave in a foreign land. All right? So he's in Egypt, but he finds favor because Scripture says God was with Joseph. Anywhere Joseph went, God was with him. So in the land of Egypt, he sold to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar, wealthy, powerful, smart. He realizes that Joseph is blessed. He realizes that everything Joseph does is profitable. That Joseph is good at, at making decisions for the household. That he's wise in, in sorting through the daily tasks and assigning people. That he can just run it all. But Potiphar knows it's not because of him. Potiphar realizes Joseph is blessed. Did you know you can catch blessings just by hanging out with godly people? It's amazing. It's amazing. Look, it's like playing the lottery. You hang out with a bunch of godly people and you see blessings start popping up around them and it just don't make no sense. Why are they so blessed? It's because they're God's children. God, his storehouses don't run dry. They don't run empty. And if he's with you, he's with you. It don't matter if you're in Egypt at Potiphar's house or the next place Joseph's going to go. So, Joseph's powerful. He's young, he's attractive, he's got everything going for him. Potiphar's wife takes notice. She said, man, that Joseph, Jojo, Jojo got it going on. Jojo has got it going on. Mm -hmm. He looks good, he's young, and he runs everything. So she starts trying to have an intimate relationship with Joseph. Joseph, symbol of chest, denies her, tells her no. He tells her, how could I sin against my master? He's been so good to me. Look what Potiphar's done for me. He has restored Joseph, the slave who is now in charge of everything. He's not, even, he's not even from Egypt and he's in charge. But Potiphar's wife continues to seek an opportunity to sleep with him. So one day Joseph's in the house working and Potiphar's wife grabs on to him. Come here, Jojo! She grabs on to him. He pulls the shake on her. She moves out of the way. He leaves his cloak and it's in her hand. He's got away, but now she's got his cloak and she's got a plan. You see, Joe, Joe's not going to give me what I want, so I'll destroy him. She tells Potiphar, you see this cloak, it belongs to Joseph, the Hebrew that you brought in, the heathen that you brought into our house, and he tried to ravage me. And this is the proof. Joseph did nothing wrong. So what does Potiphar do? Potiphar goes to the Egyptian leaders, he tells them what he's done, and they throw Joseph in prison. What a chain of events. Mm -hmm. Joseph has went from favorite son to slave, leader of a house. Now he's in prison for no fault of his own. But what does the scripture say about Joseph? Even in prison, God was with him. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where Joseph went, and it doesn't matter where you go. Because if you know Jesus... They can't keep him out. The crack houses can't keep him out. The prisons can't keep him out. The, 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 the mission can't keep him out. The jails can't. Jesus goes where you go because he loves you and he loved Joseph. So God is with Joseph even in prison. And let me tell you what happens. Joseph rises to the top ranks of the prison. How is that even possible? How, how does a foreigner who was a slave who is, who is told that he is a rapist now, or attempted rapist, how does he elevate to the leader of the prison? Because who was with him? God. Amen. God was with him the whole time. So now Joseph's running things in the prison. I mean, wherever he goes, it just turns to gold. Now he's running things in the prison, right? And Joseph still has a servant mentality. Remember we talked about it last week. It says that two men were put into prison, the cupbearer and the baker. 
and it doesn't tell us why they're there. Look, we can, we can make an educated guess. If the person who's in charge of your wine and the person who's in charge of your food do something bad enough to be thrown into prison, considering that in ancient Egypt it was commonplace practice to have pharaohs assassinated, their problem was an assassination attempt. Their problem was a plan that Pharaoh got word of, so now the cupbearer and the baker are being held in prison until he can figure out who's at fault. Right? So the leader of the prison comes to Joseph and he says, Joseph, uh, I need you to look after these men. And the Bible says something very key here. It says, he went to serve them. Now he's the leader. He's got his own problems. I mean, he's a slave. He was a prisoner. He's been uh, convicted of rape. He got his own issues. But just like Jesus came here to serve us, remember what did Jesus say? Jesus said, uh, the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve. Because he loves us. Because he loves us. Right? So Joseph, having a servant mentality, he goes to these men, and he, and he inquires of them, and he gets to know them. And they come to Joseph one day, and they're troubled in their spirits. And that's how we know that it's a key. It doesn't say that they had a dream. It says that they had dreams, and they troubled them. And they asked Joseph the interpretation. And now we remember where we're at from last week. Um, the baker, or let's start with the cupbearer's interpretation was that he would be lifted back up and restored in three days. <clears throat> the baker's sitting off to the side. He wants to hear his interpretation. He steps up and... Joseph delivers one of the most difficult messages that a prophet or pastor could ever deliver. He says, in three days' time, your head will be lifted up from your body. You will be hung on a tree, and you'll die. Both messages are necessary. The, you'll be restored. God has a wonderful plan for you. And so is the time's out. You ran the race. Your time's up. Now, do we know what happened before the baker met his demise? Maybe he was scared to death and maybe he cried out to God. Maybe he said, Yahweh, I'm sorry for my sin. Save me. I mean, I'm going to tell you, we talk about prophecy a lot. But the main point of any spiritual gift is to see people come to Jesus. The main point of spiritual gifts are so that people can see that supernatural events are occurring because God, is in the mix. And God was in the mix in this prophecy. And we don't know if the baker was restored. But we do know that Joseph was faithful and delivered God's message. Now he told the cupbearer something. We talked about it. Joseph, Joseph, Joseph's smarter. He said, look, he said, you're about to be restored. You're good. Don't forget me. Remember me. I'm down here in prison. You're about to be living a good life. I looked out for you. Don't forget me. Now, is he wrong for asking? I mean, is he wrong? People of God can use their wits to get things done. Say, oh, I'm waiting on God. God God's going to take care. God gave you a mind for a reason. And he expects you to use that mind in coordination with prayer and faith to accomplish things that you never could on your own. Mm -hmm. A faith that moves mountains is a faith that is in action. Faith without action. What James told us. James said, faith without works is what? Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. So that's where our story picks up. Joseph waiting on the cupbearer to remember him. Genesis chapter 41. Before we get started, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you, to be in your word, to be with your people. Father, what an amazing blessing to wake up in the morning and arrive full of a room full of people that love each other. Father, this day and time, it just doesn't happen, but it does when you ordain it. Father, you saw fit that each and every person in this room should be here today. And Father, you love each and every person in this room, and so I just ask that as we read your word, that it not only penetrates our minds, but that it pierces our hearts. Father, that we can go out and live as examples of Jesus. Father, that we can go out and be open and honest with other people about our shortcomings and our failures, not because we're perfect, but because you were in our place. Father, we love you and we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. So we're all called up. 
We're going to start at the very beginning of 41. And it says, After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed. Oh, you know what? I apologize, guys. I do want to make an example. Go back to, to verse 22 of chapter 40. Because it fits into the story. Remember Joseph told the cupbearer to remember him. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Of course. Yeah. Was that a sin? Is it a sin to forget? Or do we actually think that he forgot? It symbolizes our relationship with God so many times when he answers prayers and we just forget about him. Amen. How many times in your life have you either prayed a prayer or know somebody that prayed a prayer, months pass, it's answered, and they take all the credit for it? I've met people that will pray for a job. They'll lose heart. They'll lose faith because they can't find a job, and months later, they get the perfect job. But they forgot God. But didn't you pray for that? Yeah, but God didn't have nothing to do with that. I put the application in. I did the interview. People, they, they, want a, they want a husband or a wife. So they pray, God, send me so I don't want to be lonely anymore. Please, Lord. Please, Father. Months pass, years pass. And all of a sudden, they meet the right him or her. And what happens? God didn't have nothing to do with that. That was me. That was chance. That prayer that I prayed, God didn't listen. If he had listened, he would have answered it like that. That's what we want. We want a God that is immediate at our beck and call. I assure you, even 90% of the believers that I know want a God that is immediate, answer your prayer right now. And if he doesn't, it's either because I lack faith or because he didn't hear me. God hears you. God hears you. He even hears the stuff you don't want him to hear, I promise. I promise you. He hears everything. And so when you pray and you're, 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 uh, your heart felt and you mean it, God's listening. He just knows what's best. It might not be right for you at that time. The situation might not have been made for you. He might have something better for you. But you got to have faith. And then you get there, and he answers. What, God did what? Who? But Adam did that. Adam got a job and a wife. You see that? God has a good way of reminding us. Or is it always devious? Sometimes it's just simple. Yeah, when things are going well, you tend to forget how you got there. Uh, maybe you it's like, oh yeah, of course God gets the credit for that. But it's easy just to move on and be like, everything's just going great. All right. Uh, do you, but you just don't come to him like you, uh, you should. Uh, you don't give thanks when you should. Do you know the sad part? That's exactly right. But do you know how many people I encounter and God answers their prayers? Then they deny him because they feel like they owe him something. Mm. Oh, now I've got to go to church. God, God came through for me. Now I've got to pray. I gotta read. You see how long this book? I gotta read this. <laughs> yeah, that's, how, that's how we are. That's how Luther got started. He was in a lightning storm, and then uh, he said, "Okay, God, if you save me from this lightning storm, I'll become a monk. I'll become a monk." And he survives, and he becomes a monk, and he no longer is going to be a lawyer like his dad wanted. And that brought him so much anguish. Uh, you know, because he was disappointed. He wasn't obeying his father at that point, so he, he felt awful. But yeah, that's how it started, right there. Amen. Luther, so 41. <laughs> After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke. First dream. As we get into the second dream, remember this. If it's from God, you're going to get confirmation. Don't have a dream and think that you need to move to Madagascar and become a missionary unless you get confirmation. We got people all over the place right now that one thing, and they think, oh, that's what I got to do. God said, God, if it's from God, he'll confirm it. Pharaoh goes right back to sleep. And when Pharaoh goes right back to sleep, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time, and behold, seven ears of grain, Plump and good were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, 
thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled. Remember the same thing with the baker and the cupbearer? What's the difference in a regular dream and a dream when God's speaking to you? Well, it's going to trouble you. It's going to stick with you. You're going to know that there's something special about it. Pharaoh knows. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all of its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams. But there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. What did Joseph say? There were none of them. What did he say? They asked him. And Joseph said, what about interpretation? He said, the interpretation belongs to God. Y'all don't know. Your witchcraft, the, the paganism, the, the worshiping of a thousand God, y'all have no idea. God knows. So let's see what happens. <clears throat> then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night. He and I each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. Been two years. Two years, and now he's going to tell Pharaoh about Joseph. What's the perfect timing, right? Let me tell you something. God, God knows the best time. It might not be right for you yet. What if the cupbearer had went to Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, this man interpreted my dream and he was right. Pharaoh had no need of, Pharaoh didn't have no dream to interpret. He might have said, well, that's great. Go get me a glass of wine. That's your job. Right? But now, now he needs Joseph. And the cupbearer has just given him a way to find out what these dreams mean. Because God's timing is always perfect. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh. It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows, but when they had eaten them, no one could have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. Now, remember, this is a dream. Just because God is speaking to Pharaoh does not mean that the normal dreamland type stuff doesn't happen. We know that it's not realistic for cows to come up out of the water anyways. But the Nile River's representation at this time is life. It gives life. It is the source of water for all of Egypt, which is the largest settlement, whatever, city at this time, right, country. The Nile River gives life. Seven plump, good-looking cows come out. And then seven ugly, emaciated cows, I imagine missing teeth and walking crooked, come out. And the seven emaciated cows gobble up the plump cows, right? This is not your average everyday thing. This is a crazy dream. And it's trouble, Pharaoh. And then God gives the confirmation. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh that he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. And the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. So what he's saying is the seven cows represent seven good years. Where in Egypt, food is going to be plenty. Food is everywhere. We don't have to worry about it. Where everybody's eating good. Everything is great. But after those seven years, there's going to become a famine. People are going to be hungry. People are going to die. There's going to be struggle throughout all the land. God gives us messages 
so that we can change course and do things that are better for us and other people. It's no selfish motivation. God speaks to me in these dreams. God does it for a purpose. Because he intends for you to do something about it. And he intends for Joseph to do something about this problem. And the most beautiful thing is, remember, Joseph's a smart guy. Joseph's not a dumb guy. And Joseph's about to give Pharaoh a plan that is, he can't say no. You know, when, when God tells you something, when God gives you a way to, to do and fulfill his work, then nothing human beings can do. They cannot stop it. You cannot stop God. And you cannot stop his people. And then we have to remember that we have a power. We have a power not just to do good, but to make a change in people's lives, in our community, and in the church. Not because we're awesome, but because God is awesome. And because God loves us. Now, how many times have you closed your eyes and prayed and not heard anything back? And you wonder, God, are you even listening to? got all these troubles and my mind is so filled up with all this gobbledygook and, and all I hear is my, my words and, and it seems like I'm just praying to this wall. God's getting ready to tell you something amazing. It's just not ready for you yet. Joseph has waited 13 years in prison. He goes in at 17 years old. For 13 years he sits in a prison. He becomes a man in prison. No freedom. And, and, you know, it doesn't tell us, but we're not dumb. Do you think Joseph just went through his day and he's like, Shh, man, the cupbearer forgot me, but I'm good. This, I'm in prison, but I'm, I got it. I'm good. Do you think he was all, or do you think he was depressed? Do you think that he struggled? I don't know if any, if any of you guys have been locked up, but there is a demoralizing and demeaning way that you're treated. And even though Joseph's in power, cares about people. Remember that servant mentality he has? So just the fact that he has to see other people suffering adds to his own suffering. It's double time for God's people when we see others hurting. You know, we, we can bear our own pain sometimes. It's just like looking at your children. It's easy for me to hurt, but if they hurt, man, that's bad. And the closer you come to Jesus, the more you have a love for other people that's astronomically unexplainable except through supernatural power of Jesus Christ. And when they're hurting, you hurt. So Joseph's got a double time. He's seeing people hurt. He's locked up. He's been locked up since he was 17. This isn't an easy life. Maybe you feel like you're in prison today. Maybe, maybe you're struggling so bad. Maybe, maybe you're trying to find the answers and you don't know which way to turn. Maybe you feel like you're in a cell. And you feel like you've been there for a long time. And, and you believe in Jesus. So why should you be there? Why? It's not supposed to be like this. I'm not supposed to have pain in my body. I'm not supposed to be poor. I'm not supposed to be in prison. I beg to differ. I think you're supposed to be exactly where God has you at so he can get you ready to accept the blessings that are coming. Did you know there's blessings that, that God has for you that you ain't even ready for? Joseph was not ready to lead Egypt at 17 years old. Through the events that occur in prison, remember, he, he's made the leader in prison, right? He's running stuff. He learned how to manage by being the leader of prison. Now, I hope that nobody in here has to learn that way. But God knows best. God knows best. And Joseph never lost faith. We're about to see he doesn't forget God. He doesn't think God's forgotten him. You know, it's just our plan doesn't always line up with God's plan. So it's time to decide whose side are we on. Do we want God to be on our side? Or will we be on God's side? I assure you, God knows much more than I and much more than you. But if we're on his side for what we were created to do, we will find peace. We will find rest. We will find a love that we didn't know existed. All right. <clears throat> then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. Let's jump down to 28. It is as I told Pharaoh, 
God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God. Confirmation. It's fixed. There's nothing you can do about it. The famine's coming. What are we going to do about it? God will shortly bring it about. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that there are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. So Joseph tells him, Pharaoh, cool, no big deal. I got you, check this out. What we're going to do is, for seven years, we're going to have more than we need anyways. So during those seven years, we're going to take a fifth of everything, and we're going to store it away. We're going to pack it away, we're going to keep it. So when the famine comes, we'll be able to push through it, because we have done the right thing. Just like a squirrel hides nuts, right? He tells the Egyptians, look, get up, get all the Egyptians, Look, we're going to get this food and we're going to hide it away so we can make it through this tough time, this famine. Pretty smart. Considering that they weren't doing this already and that they were about to starve to death. Joseph is about to save Egypt. A prisoner, a slave, accused rapist, is about to save Egypt. A land of non-believers. Remind you, Jesus died for everybody. For everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. Remember the dreams? We talked about Pharaoh just had dreams. Two to one. Two to one through the Bible, God speaks to non-believers over believers in dreams. He's trying to get their attention. He's trying to get their attention. Maybe today God's trying to get your attention. <clears throat> this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as your command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up a hand or a foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, zephanoth paneh And he gave him in marriage to Asenoth, the daughter of Potiphar priest of on. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. He says, you know what? I can see God is working inside of you. That God's Spirit has made you a man above men. That God's Spirit has made you wise beyond your years. And that I need you by my side. Pharaoh's not done. Just like Potiphar. They see something special in Joseph and they know that special is God. And so Joseph now has been lifted up, far above leading a prison, far above being a head slave. Now he's second of all Egypt. He's not even Egyptian. He's not. Did you know God takes outcasts and misfits and just puts them in positions that, that they that they don't don't seem to fit? I mean, Joseph is a Hebrew, but now he's leading Egypt. Pharaoh says, Pharaoh said nobody will even lift their foot. Unless you say so. And when they come, when, when you ride in my chair, they're going to say, bow the knee, and people are going to bow before you. Wow, what a change. You know, we've done a lot of talking about mm. dreams, but do we remember those first dreams that Joseph had that got him in all that trouble? When he said that his mom, his brothers, would wow. bow down around him? Man, man, that's not seeming so far-fetched anymore, is it? It's amazing what God will do. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 
Who else was 30 when they started their ministry? Jesus. Amen. I'm proud of y'all. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly, and he gathered up all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt. And he put the food in the cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenoth, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship in all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come. As, Jesus, as Joseph had said, there was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe all over the earth. So it wasn't just Egypt. The whole earth is going through a famine and the only place that has food is Egypt because of Joseph now God's plan is not done God's plan is not done because remember the dreams that he gave Joseph God doesn't do anything halfway and as God's people we shouldn't do anything halfway never we owe God more than that we could never repay him and if we fall short, he'll forgive us. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Joseph not only is leading Egypt, but everybody in the rest of the world has to come to him to get food now. It's absolutely incredible. From a slave to a prisoner to second in command of the world, basically, at this point. Because everybody else has to come to Egypt for help. Joseph had one thing going for him. God was with him. Let's pray. Father, it can become so easy to see ourselves like Joseph, to see how others have done us wrong, to point the finger, to accuse him, Father, to try to push the guilt and shame <coughs> away from us. But Father, I believe that we're probably more like the cupbearer. I believe that, that you've probably done some amazing things for each person in this room. Father, that, that you answered prayers that they even forgot that they prayed. Father, that, that you came through and you showed up and showed out when they didn't even acknowledge you. And Father, I ask for forgiveness because I know that I've done the same. Father, I am the cupbearer. Father, I ask that you please continue to work on our hearts. Father, draw us near to one another as you draw us near to you and show us the path that you would have us to travel no matter how difficult it is. Father, I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I just want to make a quick announcement real quick. Um, so July 2nd and 3rd, I'm hosting an event here in Greenville, and um, the second, July the 2nd, Pastor Adam will be speaking, and followed after that will be Candace Smithyman. I'm happy to come down from uh, Florida. Also, um, on the 3rd, there will be uh, Cedric will be speaking, and then followed by Keenan T. Bridges. So just want to let y'all know, so y'all don't make plans for that weekend, because I know it's the July 4th and weekend. And that's the guy who's studying we're going through right yes. now. Uh, yes. He'll be speaking in Greenville uh, at this event. Yeah, so this will be the biggest event I've actually ever done. Usually it's only like a two speakers, but I'm going to have four speakers. So. I looked them up. They've both written like four books and all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So... Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Yeah. They both have TV shows. They both. <laughs> no, um, I'm actually going to be doing it at a church. Yeah. Where? Uh, it's, it's. It's over there by San Sushi. Uh, you got all the information. It's it's a, it's in my, the neighborhood I grew up in. The yeah. church. Is. How 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 wild is that? <laughs> the chances. San's got it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, All in there. Right?